I became a Christian in my late teens, as many of you know. It was in the context of a Baptist church in my hometown in Plymouth. There was a particular couple who were undoubtedly the most wealthy couple in the church, Stephen and Barbara. And um, they certainly carried themselves in a way that you knew they had resources. And uh, I was a little intimidated by this and didn't really feel I could get to know them very well. But I had a conversation with Barbara once uh, when I was in the church, and we were cleaning and tidying the sanctuary uh, on one particular Saturday, and she made herself very vulnerable. She said, um, we used to own a boat, and we had it moored out on Plymouth Sound, and um, she said, Stephen and I used to love this boat, and we used to be able to take it and go along the coast, go up to Wembury, or go down to Lou and Polpero. Um, we used to journey up the River Tamar. We loved this boat. But in some sense, maybe the boat became too important to us. And sometimes it was a distraction. Sometimes at a weekend, maybe sometimes on a Sunday, we would choose to go out of the boat rather than coming to worship. And she said one time, the boat caught fire. There was an electrical fault. And the whole thing was consumed in flames and sank to the bottom of Plymouth Sound. And she said, initially, I was gutted. And then I thought... God has done this, and it has to be wonderful in my eyes. He has removed the idol, the focus, and reasserted himself at the center of my life. Is our God the God who sets light to boats? Is our God a remote God? Or is our God a jealous God? Is our God a God who is happy with a little? Or is our God so greedy for our attention and our affection that he really wants all of us? The passage that we have in front of us is certainly a challenging passage, reminding us that actually if we affirm that the Lord is one, and we should love the Lord with all our heart and our soul and our strength, then we should be giving all as he gives all. We've been focusing here at Lewin during the course of this year on what Jews call the Shema. It is the statement in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 4 to 9. The word Shema comes from the Hebrew word to hear. Because it starts, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. At the moment, you're quite attentive. It doesn't always happen in Baptist churches, especially on a sunny bank holiday morning. And so the danger can be that we're here, but we're not hearing. We are present, but we're not concentrating. One of the dangers is that so often in the way in which we focus on God's word is that we can miss quite easily recognizing what God is doing in our midst and the way that he is addressing and speaking truth into our lives. And so this particular statement, the Shema, states over us that we should hear that truth. In other words, there is a central truth that we must affirm. And so it says here, O Israel, the Lord is one. What we believe as Jews and as Christians is that God is one being. We are monotheists. And this, remember, of course, was an important statement when this was made in the time that Deuteronomy was written. Because in those days, almost everybody had a range of gods. But it was to the Jews that they particularly understood that God revealed that God was one. And that he was the only one. But of course, this isn't just some abstract statement of faith. This is not just simply saying that we believe in one God as others believe in many gods. It's saying that our belief in one God should draw us to a worship of that one God, a love of that one God, a devotion to that one God. Because immediately after the statement says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. So we don't live in a statement but we live in a relationship. We're not creedal, but we're relational. We are involved in a connection with God. 
Indeed, Scripture affirms strongly that as God has loved the people of Israel, so we should respond in love to him, a deep bonding, a deep commitment to him. In fact, the word that's used here in Hebrew is used by the prophet Hosea of the relationship between a husband and a wife or a parent and a child. It is a deep covenantal love. It is a committed love. It's an involved love. It's an intimate love. And so this statement at the beginning of the Shema isn't just a statement of God's identity, but it's a statement of our identity as believers, as worshippers, as servants of the true and the living God. So the Shema is terribly important at affirming that there should be a single focus on the Lord. And I would suggest to you that the background, particularly to this text, is actually just a chapter before the statements of the Ten Words, or what we call the Ten Commandments. They appear in Exodus, but they also appear in Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy chapter 5, if you have your Bibles open and you look back, you will see that there is a statement in the first two of the Ten Commandments in a way reflecting and drawing out the principles that are represented in the Shema. Verse 7, you shall have no other gods before me. Verse 8, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or earth below or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. When he says, you shall have no other God before me, the Hebrew means either near me or in opposition to me. In other words, you shouldn't have a God that rivals your devotion to the true God. There should only be a recognition of a space within your life for worship of one God and one God only, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the focus. And then secondly, you shouldn't be, therefore, in the business of creating an idol or an image, something else that will draw you away from worship to the true and the living God. So the basis of the Shema is to say that the Lord is one. He should be, therefore, the one true alone Lord and center of your heart and your life. And nothing, nothing, nothing else should cut in on that relationship. Now, yesterday, I had an opportunity to travel to Oxford uh, with Tim and Sungi. Tim, who read earlier, um, is on the staff at the Oxford College of Missionary Studies. And they had an open day. And uh, you know your pastor, so the deal was that I would go along to the open day, and I thoroughly enjoyed the open day, not least because it also gave me an access to visit their center, which is a rather big, grand Victorian church. And then I also said, well, I'd like to go off and also see the cathedral and take some pictures. So they dutifully tagged along. And um, I wanted to actually particularly to see a window in Oxford Cathedral. Oxford Cathedral, smallest cathedral in Britain, and it's actually the chapel of Christ Church College, the largest of the colleges in Oxford, the most prestigious. And there's one window which tells a story. It tells the story of Jonah, but the window also tells another story. It was part of a sequence of windows that were all put in in the 1630s when King Charles I was on the throne. It's a beautiful window, and there was a whole range of them all the way around the building. But if you know your history, Charles I was beheaded, and then Britain became a republic. And the Puritans, and I was doing some stuff on this at Spurgeon's only just early this week, so it's very fresh in my mind. The Puritans, who were very strong on the word of God and the Ten Commandments, that we should not have any images or any idols... They went through Oxford Cathedral and they pushed all these windows out that had only been in for 15 years. They shoved them out and Cromwell got his horses to trample on the glass that they've recently now found, some of the fragments. And they kept the one of Jonah because they realized that Jonah obviously was the one who came to be a prophet of doom. And so they thought, well, he's probably okay. But all the rest of the windows, they need to go because they're a distraction in worship. And it was all to do with the breaking of images. In fact, in some sense, we are Puritans. Look around us. There's not a great deal. There's a man in a suit at the front. There's a cross in the corner, which was unusual because Baptists would never have even had that in the 17th century. The windows, there's nothing in them but some Art Nouveau glass. Not terribly well done, but 
Baptists didn't have a lot of money at the turn of the 20th century. There's no sort of beautiful stained glass anywhere. There's a, a banner at the front, which is kind of modern charismatic, you know. But the building's quite really plain. And we're the kind of the legacy of that. You know, don't have anything in the building that distracts from worship. Now, that's a good principle. But the problem is, is that getting rid of idols is not as easy as pushing a window out and getting a horse to walk on it. Luther, the Protestant reformer, he said, you can get rid of all the windows, you can get rid of all the statues, but still people can have idols in their heart. That's the problem. The problem can be that often, even as we're sitting in worship, our mind is somewhere else, we're focusing on something else, something else is drawing our attention. Many people towards the end of a service are idolizing their dinner. They're thinking, they're almost getting the aroma of the roast pork coming into their heads and they're already on a trip, which is to do with calories and fat and gravy and cake and it's absolutely nothing to do with the service at all. They're just ODing on food. I mean, people's minds can be in all sorts of places. Pushing out the windows, my friends, doesn't get rid of images or idols. Because an idol is in your heart. The question of this passage is, what is inside you? Not what's in the window, but what's inside of you. So let's look briefly at this famous story. And many of you, even if you don't know the Bible very well, you will know something of the story of the golden calf. And it's very relevant to this particular event. Because almost immediately after the Ten Commandments comes this tragic moral and spiritual collapse for the people of Israel. I'm not going to give you a detailed exegesis, a detailed description of this story, partly because many of you know it, partly because of time, but partly because I want to illustrate to you the dangers of idolatry, of having an image or something in your heart that pulls you away from God. So we're going to look at these under a number of related points. We've considered the desire for the true God, which is the next slide, and then beyond that now, the desire for false gods, like you'd have open in front of Exodus 32. We're going to think about this under five quick points. First of all, the enchantment of idolatry. So the people are frustrated. What drives this initially is impatience. You know, I mean, the people are a bit, almost a bit rude, aren't they, in text? You know, this fellow Moses, like, as if I'm, I don't even know who he is, you know, thinking, come on, guys, you've been walking with him for years through the world. You know exactly who Moses is. This fellow Moses, he's disappeared. You know, he's gone up the mountain, and we don't know where he is. So, come on, we're going to have to now do DIY religion, because actually the, the spiritual boss has evaporated, he's disappeared, you know, he's left the building, and so therefore, while the cat's away, the mice will play. We need to do something else because there is a difference. There's a distance now because of his absence. And so they pressurize Aaron. They say, listen, we want something to worship. Um, we want to have something which is tangible and real. So Aaron, under their pressure, gathers together all these gold earrings and he melts them down and he produces a calf. Now, a couple of things. Probably this is not a solid gold calf. We know that because later it's burnt. It's probably a wooden calf covered in gold. And that would make sense also for the amount of gold that was needed. But secondly, and more importantly, it's not a good translation to call it a calf. The Hebrew word is egel. And in fact, uh, there was a king of Moab, one of the neighboring nations called Eglon, almost the same word, and his symbol was the bull. It's actually a bull, not a calf. And that's very significant because the Canaanite peoples, the people who were in the promised land that the Israelites were journeying to, the people who were around them worshipped God in the form of a bull. Without making too much of a labor point, you will know even now there are many people across this world that worship God in the form or gods in the form of a bull. So it's still an image with religious potency. So it's not a calf not a cuddly calf, it is a bull. And they are involved, they're drawn into this worship experience. What drew, draws this? What fuels this? They want to have a visible God. The invisible God with no images is too remote and too difficult to deal with. So they need to have a tangible God. I repeat, they need 
maybe even you need. You don't actually, it don't do you any good, but you feel in your heart you need a tangible God. But my friends, we have an intangible God. And if you have a tangible God, it's getting in the way of an intangible God. If you have a visible God, it's in the way of an invisible God. If we have the next image, please. This particular individual is the leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un. His father, the first leader of North Korea, Kim Il-sung, has been described by the Koreans as the creator of the world. That might be a surprise to you. I'm sure it's a surprise to God, although maybe he was aware that the guy was involved in blasphemy. And then he called himself a god, and then his son, who was this guy's father, um, Kim Jong-il, described himself as the sustainer of all things, which sounds a familiar title for somebody else, and the controller of the weather, and the son of a god. And this person also views himself as a god. And if you go on such things as YouTube, and you put in North Korean presidential worship, you will see people fanatically bowing in front of paintings, and applauding almost in manic form, worshipping, and that's the term which we have to use, worshipping this leader. And in some sense, people, and we might say this is because of pressure, because of the insanity of the North Korean regime, because of the control and the manipulation of the leader, well, some of that's true. But the reality is also many, many people, they want a, a man, they don't want God. They want someone who is divine in human form. And they're much more comfortable with that than they are with some remote and invisible God. There are some of you who want a priest more than you want the Lord God. This is, again, pushing things. There was a guy who was in my living room last night. He was a church member. He's here. And he said, um, Phil, he said, sometimes he said, I love being part of Stretton Baptist Church. He said, but I worry whether sometimes people want a piece of Phil more than they want a piece of Jesus. See, some people, they want to get hold of the minister. You pray for me. You do this. You speak to me. Rather than actually the fact that every single one of you in this place has exactly the same access to God through Jesus in the power of the Spirit as me or Gary or Terry. You have the same access. We're simply here to facilitate. But you have all you need. You don't need us. We're here just to help you. We are fellow saved sinners who walk with you. But people still, they want a holy man. And it might be the Catholics dressing people up like Christmas trees and wanting to go, oh, just tell me I'm forgiven. Or the Pentecostals, like, oh, look at this man, I've just got to touch the hem of his coat. I mean, all of it, it's madness. The people of Israel at one point said, we can't cope with just having God. What we really want is a king. We want to be like everywhere else. And you hear the cry, the heart of God, where he says, in Samuel, they have rejected me. We want often to go to a shrine, to go to a holy place, a holy spot, rather than simply realizing that according to Jesus, even your closet, which could even be your toilet, is a holy place with the Lord. Because he's there. Because he's always with you. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us period. So we need to get beyond visible God. Secondly, we need to get beyond simply enjoying idolatry. Next image. Idolatry, of course, can be fun. Well, of course, you see, they, what they do is they, they throw uh, a festival, and somewhat bizarrely, Aaron says, actually, this festival is going to be a festival for Yahweh. I'm, you know, how bizarre. It's going to be a festival for God, and we're going to have burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but we're also going to play, and the Hebrew word for play is sex play. So we're going to have worship for the living God, and we're also going to have prostitution and free love and eat too much and get drunk, thinking that's interesting. How crazy is that? But the Israelites weren't the first people, and they will not be the last people who actually think that they can blend worshipping the true God with idolatry. So the danger can be that within our own lives, within our own worship, we cross things over and the water becomes muddied and unclean. Neil and I travelled to Kerala in southern India in 2008. About 25% of the population of Kerala in southern India claim to be Christians. One of the strange things is that if you drive around, for example, Cochin, one of the principal towns in Kerala, as we did, you will see lots of Indian Christians standing at street corner shrines praying very early in the morning. 
The thing that Neil said to me, immediately as he looked at this, he said, this looks like Hindu practice, but with the Virgin Mary leading the gang. That somehow a Hindu god has been replaced by a Christian figure. And that what we've actually done here is somehow reincarnated Christianity to be quasi-Hindu. And somehow it's become blended. But my friends, we can all do that. We can all do that. Now here Mr. Robinson goes a long way out, hovering over very deep water. Did you hear what is said as Moses and Joshua come down the hill? I hear only, God says, the sound of singing. I've been a minister for 28 years, and I've been strongly identified with encouraging contemporary worship in churches. But the difficulty is, is that if church life is a gig, if it's a rock concert more than it is worship, we've lost the plot. I went to a worship conference last summer at a church I won't name, and I think the only thing that was missing was crowd surfing. I mean, everybody was so revved up, I just expected somebody from the band to jump out onto the, all the people raving at the front, and they'd catch them and pass them back. You know. Now, I am not saying, don't misunderstand me, I am not saying that our worship should be stuck in aspic in the past. For many, many years, Baptists particularly have been guilty of presenting God as stuck in the 1950s, the 1850s, or the 1650s. We need to worship in a way which means something in our culture. But if our culture takes over and people are turning up for a rock rave as young whites or they're turning up, dare I say, for a black gospel geek, it may end up being a concert more than worship. And you can see the adulation sometimes is on the band. Everybody at the front has to be perfect. In some churches, you will know that you will not get in the band. You will not be in the, in the front if you are on the stage, if you are fat, if you're over 50, and you're not dressing well, because you don't fit with the image of that church. What is that saying, my friends? That is idolatry, because what you're doing is you're constructing a worship experience, which is not about worship, but it's about image, and it's about an authentic, spiritual, come, musical event. So we can't just sing. What we do today has got to be about the Lord. And it has to arise from our hearts that we want to get beyond a performance and engage with the true and living God. So we've got to be ever so careful with some of this stuff. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we shouldn't engage in contemporary worship forms. What I am saying is that we need to keep looking in our hearts to see how real what we're doing is. You can often see non-Christians come in and they see through the whole thing. This is a big show, they'll say. I didn't sense anything. The band was great. The atmosphere, the vibe was good. But I didn't find Jesus in this. So we need to be careful. Thirdly, the exposure of idolatry. Moving on. God informs Moses of the idolatry. He directs Moses and um, Joshua to deal with it. As they, they go, go down the hill, as they hear this noise rising up, they throw the tablets down. And so, therefore, the calf is destroyed by Moses. And the idolatry, therefore, is directly challenged by God through God's agents. See, in the end, if idolatry is the equivalent of an affair of the heart, God will speak to you about it. If you're married... And you know that your husband and your, or your wife is having an affair. You will not be happy. And you'll challenge it. At some point, you'll want it exposed. Because you know that the heart of your companion is compromised. And if God knows that you are really worshipping something else, which might be good, bad, or indifferent, it might even be something spiritual, he will challenge it. About 15 years ago, I found myself in my first church profoundly challenged by God, looking at my heart to see whether actually even my engagement in the ministry of that church had become an idol. 
looking at one or two key relationships which had become really too important. Recognizing that there was a whole range of things that had crowded in and that whilst I was ministering, I wasn't ministering out of a place of soul engagement with God. And so I took sabbatical in 2002 and I went away and it was really just me and the Lord. There are times when God will strip things away. See, sometimes if you idolize something, you're going to screw it up anyway. You're going to mess it up. If you idolize a person, then actually they'll take advantage of you. Or actually you'll wreck the relationship. If you idolize a career, your whole relationship with a career will become distorted. If you idolize a ministry, it'll become more about you than it is about Jesus. So if you idolize something, you end up wrecking it anyway. And I think God allows you to wreck it. He steps back and he says, if you want this calf, well, then I will step back and I'll let you realize that it is a calf. And then at some point, you and I will get involved and we'll throw it on the fire and burn it. And then you might get something back which could be similar, but it's godly and it's in the right position. But I will walk with you through the tearing down of the idol. But my friends, that is not fun. But in the end, although it's scary, the final place is sweet. Listen, it's sweet. Because when it's just you and Jesus, it's more than fine. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. When ministry and people and money and possessions and hopes and aspirations, everything is stripped away, there is still you and the Lord. And that is the most important thing. And you know the lover of your soul is with you. And everything else is just an extra that can get in the way. We're nearly finished. The enticement of idolatry. Moses challenges his brother. How did you let this happen? Aaron is so pathetic at this point. I mean, he just blames. He says, oh, these people, you know that they're so unreliable. You know, whenever we get them together, they don't know what they're going to do. He just blames the people. He stands in the tradition of Adam and Eve. It's somebody else's fault. You know. When we get sucked into doing something wrong, we are so quick to blame somebody else. Some people, they have an affair, and it's always the person they've had an affairs with fault. It's nothing to do with them. They, oh, I just got seduced. I got enticed. Really? Well, you just switched your brain off, and you fell into adultery. No, you just ended up giving all your money to buy certain things that you don't need. And what, the, just, the credit card company stole your money in buying all these things. Sometimes we're just fools. We think somehow it's always the things that we've actually got involved in falsely worshipping as Christians, somehow we fell into it. Even more ridiculous in the Hebrew, it says, Tim read it so well, that actually as the, the gold came out of the fire, wow, it just became a calf. The Hebrew actually implies that virtually it's a miracle. I mean, it's a nonsensical statement. And sometimes we strain at straws, trying to find any old justification for the foolishness of the compromise in our hearts. But my friends, we've just got to take ownership of our own rubbish. And if your heart is compromised, if you're more in love with somebody else than God, it's involving you. If you're more in love with your bank balance than God, it's something to do with you. If you're more in love with your career than God, it's something to do with you. If it, you're more in love with your ministry than you are with serving God and knowing him, then that's something to do with you. Take ownership of it. And don't just say it's safety in numbers. Of course it's safety in numbers. Plenty of people want to have affairs. Plenty of people in this community are not faithful to their partners. Plenty of people are horrible to their children. Plenty of people are un un disloyal to their friends. Plenty of people are irresponsible at work. Plenty of people have far too much debt and buy things they don't need. Plenty of people in the church are on a power trip. Plenty of pastors are power-crazed idiots who just are using their congregations for their own ego. But that doesn't justify any of us from buying into that rubbish. We have to recognize that we are answerable for our own souls and our own lives. And so Aaron just wants to pass the buck, but you cannot pass the buck. If there's idolatry in your heart, it doesn't matter if the person even sitting next to you this morning is doing the same nonsense. You have to sort it out for yourself. You have to say, it's me and the Lord. And everything else is getting in the way. And if other people are doing it, it's their problem. But I am answerable for my own soul. Lastly, he's saying how that there are effects, and there's this extraordinary statement at the end. 
And I wanted just to give um, an image of King Saul, recognizing that Saul was the king who, through his compromise, through his, his desire to have power and influence, effectively lost the plot. He lost the anointing upon his life. He remained king. He remained the Lord's anointed, but God wasn't really with him. And the danger is, is that if you compromise and you have the freedom in Christ to remain compromised, Paul has said this, you can do so many things. Everything is possible, but not everything is beneficial. You have a freedom to let your heart wander and not, you're not compelled. We're not ordered. We're not, we're not, dare I say, extreme Muslims where we're running a police state and everybody needs to be regulated in terms of their faith. If you choose to have a compromised life before God, it is your call, but there is a price to pay. And the price to pay is that we may still remain with God, but we are no longer in the center of his will. We're no longer under the anointing of God. I need to finish. I want to make this personal at the end. I know, as a 53-year-old Baptist minister, that unless I walk in obedience to God, then there will be no anointing on me. The anointing will leave. And so that keeps me focused. Why I have to keep coming back, even as I was praying before coming to the service today and saying, Lord, it has to be about you. It has to be about you. And I need to keep that because if I let other stuff creep in, then I will be less effective. And I don't know, in the end, we bought into a radical discipleship. But see, it's radical to say the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. It's not saying love him on Sunday mornings. It's not saying love him when you feel like it. It's not saying love him as long as nobody finds out you're committing adultery. It's not saying love him and love Visa and MBNA and American Express. It's not saying love him and love your career. It's not saying love him and love your ministry. It's not saying love him and love your church. It's saying love him alone. Alone. It's even not saying love him and love your wife, love him and love your husband, love him and love your best friend, love him and love your daughter, love him and love your son. It's saying love him. We love him, and then everything else falls into place. He alone is God. He alone is God. And if you let something else come into your heart, you need to tear it out. Don't smash the window, but smash the window in your heart. Just before I left, last thing, I was praying. And I looked, and you know, it was so bright this morning. Any of you had this? You look at it and think, oh, gosh, my windows are so dirty. <laughs> you know, that's the worst thing about spring, isn't it? You get through the winter and it's so dark and gloomy. Nobody knows whether your wind windows are dirty or not because the weather's dirty. You know. But there was dirt on the inside and there was dirt on the outside. And I thought, you know, I really need to clean the windows because I can't see the garden properly. And the sun can't really properly get in. The thing is, you need to clean your windows. I need to clean my windows on a regular basis in my heart. Jesus said, blessed are those who are pure in heart. Why? Because they'll see God. If you clean your heart, consecrate, as the Levites would, consecrate yourself to God, say, Lord, I am yours, then the dirt comes off, and then Jesus, he shines on you more. You see him more. Let's pray together. A lot of what's been said this morning is not easy. It's not easy for me to say. It's not easy for us to receive, any of us, including me. But it is what God expects. He's a jealous God. And he wants you. He doesn't want a bit of you. He doesn't want you to be compromised with bad things. He doesn't even want your heart to be compromised with focusing on good things that then become idols. And then the engagement with those good things becomes bad. He just wants to be at your heart. I would urge you, if the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you about laying down an idol, or idols in your life. I would urge you to stand and lift your hands as you recognize the Lordship and the oneness of God. And we will pray over you. If you've heard the Holy Spirit speak, I would just urge you to stand in his presence and lift your hands in honoring to the one true and living God. Here, Lewin, 
The Lord our God is one. Love the Lord our God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind. Render your being to him. Lord, you alone are God. And I stand with many of us here and I say over my life and these friends' lives, just be our everything and be our all. Lord, help us not just to sing. Lord, this isn't a show. Because if it is a show, it's a pathetic show. It needs to be worship. And it's only worship when we're saying you're everything. We're not just singing. We're not just enjoying a good time together. Indeed, it's good to enjoy you, but it's about enjoying you, not enjoying an experience with nothing to do with you. And so, Lord, we pray, be at the heart of our lives. Jesus, be our everything. Jesus, be the center. Lord, take down the rivals in Jesus' name. If there is some person who's pushing out Jesus in our hearts, may we reposition that relationship in Jesus' name as a gift. And we affirm that you are the apple of our eye, that you are the center of our affection, and that we love you more than we love anyone else. And if there is some besetting sin that is creeping in through the back door, may we boot it back out of the door in Jesus' name. Kick it out. And if there's compromise, moral compromise, whether it's adultery, whether it's pornography, whether it is cruelty, whether it's bitterness, whatever it is, whatever level of irresponsibility and sinfulness, may we reject it in Jesus' name. Because it's a liar. It's a false God that will not deliver. It will just give us a quick buzz, but it doesn't deserve the worship of our hearts. So we reject sin in Jesus' name. And we reject any good thing any aspirant desire, any ministry, anything we do for you, Lord Jesus, may we lay it down before you and say that we don't want our ministry to be in in the way of you because you've got to be center stage. It's not about our serving you and preaching for you and singing for you and caring for you and evangelizing for you. That's not important. You are important. And then the rest of that stuff flows out of it. Lord, we lay our ministries down before you, Jesus, and we say it's all about you. It's all about you. You're the one who liberated us. And so we want to worship you with the whole of our beings. Jesus, you reminded us even in the temptations that we, according to Deuteronomy, should worship and him only, the Lord God, serve. May we truly worship you in spirit and in truth. Burn the calf. Break the gold bull. Break it and burn it, Jesus, that the Son of God, the bright and morning star, who burns and burns and burns brighter than any gold calf, may this bright and morning star, the light of the world, may he flood our hearts and lives. And all the people said,